Good morning everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank you all for showing your support to my wife and I basically during these difficult times. Uh, it means a lot to us and I do apologise that I can't be there with you in person today, but hopefully this video presentation will suffice uh, and I know we have a Q&A session at the end of it, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, my name is Matthew Griffin. Uh, I'm the CEO of the 311 Institute, uh, a global think tank, and we help a variety of different organisations around the world decode the future and decode disruption. So with no further ado, I'd like to crack into the presentation, uh, which I've entitled The Future of FMCG. So uh, we work with a whole variety of different organisations around the world, everyone from the likes of Huawei, who we help design the next generations of smartphones up till about 2040, Organisations like Qualcomm, basically who we help understand the future of intelligent machines, again up to a kind of timeline of around 2040. I sit on the Technology and Innovation Board of Centrica and uh, it's a blast. Now for any of you who watched Star Trek, Star Wars, any of those kinds of movies years and years ago, kind of in the 1970s, the 1980s and the 1990s, there are a lot of science fiction things basically that were depicted in those movies uh, that are now starting to become science fact. So I want to walk you through a couple of those. So for example, if we have a look at deflector shields, yeah, deflector shields basically are thought to be science fiction, but today we have a way to create them. Uh, so we fire a high intensity laser beam at a portion of the atmosphere, it creates something called a Fermi effect, and that creates a deflector shield that will actually deflect lasers. Um, however, that particular innovation is still at a concept stage with British Aerospace, uh, but some of the things basically that we grew up with as science fiction aren't. Uh, so things like tractor beams. Um, about a couple of years ago, we managed to finally start moving small individual atoms and molecules around, albeit a couple of nanometers, with light and sound. Now, from a industrial perspective, developing a tractor beam might not actually sound that interesting. You know, what are you going to do with it outside of the defense space? Uh, but today, those same tractor beams and the principles that underline them are being embedded into 3D printers. So you get a 3D printer that prints a variety of different electronic components, materials, products, and bits and pieces, and then you can move the, those individual components around in situ, and you can have the 3D printer assemble complicated electronics in situ. So that's actually a science fiction, piece of science fiction that has now become science fact, and it's now starting to find a commercial application in the advanced manufacturing sector. Other things basically that you know, we've we sort of grown up with are uh, aliens. Uh, now again, you and I basically have something in common basically not just with horses and the animals basically and cattle basically that we see today, but also with the dinosaurs and the first amoeba-like creatures that crawled out of the primordial ooze around three and a half billion years ago. Uh, all of our DNA has four base pairs. Uh, so last year we created a completely new type of life form that has six base pairs. Furthermore, we ended up digitizing it and emailing it to a 3D bioprinter in this case uh, that was in the next door room basically to a, a sort of a bunch of, uh, bunch of scientists and managed to 3D print a virus. Now viruses are actually considered living organisms. Uh, some people say they are, some people say they aren't, but we'll, we'll say they are, basically for the, uh, <laughs> for the benefit of the audience. Now, that particular technology is now being called a biological teleporter. We've digitized life, we've sent it to somewhere digitally, electronically, whatever you want to call it, and we've printed it out and it is alive at the other end. So whether we are doing that basically to the room next door or whether we're doing that to Mars, doesn't really make much difference. The process is the same. Now, with that in mind, what I'd like to take you through now basically is a topic uh, that's certainly close to my heart, disruption mechanics. Now, a lot of organizations and a lot of people basically always say, change is a constant. And what they typically mean by that is change is always all around us. But the phrase change is a constant itself is misleading. Change is not a constant. Change is accelerating. And whether we call it exponential, depending how you look at it, change, irrespective of the industry that you are in or the position that you hold in society, is accelerating. Similarly, we are, when we talk about disruption, a lot of organizations feel that just because they're innovating or innovative, they are automatically 
should we say, moving into a position where they can disrupt the status quo. But disruption is not innovation, and innovation is not disruption. Disruption is innovation coupled with execution. So you innovate something, and then you've got to get it into the marketplace. They are fundamentally different things, but they still play into the same part of the jigsaw puzzle. Now, when we have a look at uh, the DNA, should we say, yeah, the four base DNA of a disruptor, uh, there are three sides to the pyramid that we can talk about. So firstly, on the right hand side, there is the operational part of the pyramid. Uh, so those are organizations, you know, you have to have the right vision, the right mission, the right culture, the right communication, uh, the right collaborative uh, environment. Uh, you have to have the right focus on innovation, you know, customer needs, unmet needs, requirements, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then once you've actually discovered something that you think pro you know, companies and individuals might like to buy because there is an unmet need for it, you've got to prototype it. And when you prototype it, you then build it, test it, design it, you do all sorts of things. And then eventually you've got to execute and you've got to get it out of the market. So you've got to build your channel. Uh, you've got to set the right price point. It's got to be a affordable, all these sorts of things. Now, on the left-hand side of the triangle, we have exponential technologies, because all of the different things that we're building and constructing and designing today, the next generation of products and services, inevitably involve some form of technology. Now, whether that's current day, or whether it's futuristic technology, they all include technology. If you take a product, you've still got to manufacture it, and then you use technology to help you deliver the capabilities and the things that you want that new product or service to deliver uh, in order to yeah, create a functioning product. And then uh, finally, at the bottom of the pyramid, if you really want to disrupt, trying to disrupt uh, at a small scale isn't disruption. You've got to go big. If you want to change a market, if you want to change culture, you've got to be able to scale, grow, and you've got to be able to do it fast. Uh, because the faster that you do it, the more disruptive that is to the market, the incumbents, and the incumbents will typically be, a, be challenged to catch up. So, however, you know, when we have a look at adoption, you know, we have a couple of things going for us. So, uh, social networks, you know, the network effect as everyone calls it. You know, today, if you can find the right levers, you can get your product in front of argument's sake, one and a half to two billion eyeballs. You could never have done that 10 years ago. Um, similarly, but when we have a look at things like geopolitics, geopolitics will affect how quickly or whether, or whether at all your product is actually embraced. Uh, things like regulations, you could have the best product, it could be free, it could change the world, but if the regulators say that you can't sell it, uh, if the regulators say no, you can't use it. You, so uh, again, uh, there are lots and lots of different things that play in. And then, of course, we come through to culture and cultural bias. Um, if you have a look, for example, at the Indian market, you know, the Indian uh, FMCG market is very, very different to the American FMCG market. So, depending on the market you're playing into, culture plays a very important part in, you help, in helping you get your products out there and being successful. However, again, if we now start taking some of the covers off, uh, disruption. Uh, let's start having a look at some of the industry value chains. If you step back to the 20th century, for example, the value chains basically that they were accustomed to, they would take some raw goods, they would process them, they would turn them into something useful, they would wrap a sales and marketing campaign around it and then a support structure, and that would typically be it. However, today, yeah, today's value chains are increasingly digital. So, the physical products are increasingly being dematerialized, and now we are starting to see digital play a much, much more important role, basically, within quite a lot of different industries. And whether digital is important throughout your entire value chain depends a little bit on the industry that you're actually in. Uh, whether you can move away from building and shipping physical products, again, that sort of depends on the industry that you're actually in. But increasingly, there are, more, there are, there are certainly more industries now that are much more heavily reliant, basically, on being digital by default uh, than ever before. And then when we have a look at disruption, if we start moving across to things like disintermediation, for example, uh, there are lots and lots of different control points within every industry. Uh, so for example, uh, 
There are different industries and different companies basically that will sell high-end products. There will be companies that sell low-end products. There will be companies basically that try to address the end of the user life cycle or the start of the, you know, the customer life cycle. Uh, there will be products basically that uh, appeal to women rather than men or that are marketed to women rather than men. Uh, and then there is an emotional angle as well. Uh, so, with a lot of organizations, if you're typically trying to sell something relatively cheap, it used to be the case that uh, you would sell and focus on price. However, increasingly today, basically all of the brands basically that sit in that sort of FMCG space are trying to present a lifestyle image. And again, how you present that lifestyle image can affect basically whether or not your brand is successful or not. Uh, however, you know, if we have a look at, for example, disintermediation in your space, uh, one of the first things that certainly comes to my mind basically, is the advent of smart appliances. So smart appliances are simply, for example, white goods basically, that now have a level of intelligence, so they have sensors built into them, uh, and for example, they can auto-order. So let's say, for example, we take a Samsung washing machine, basically, it uses Purcell. Uh, it runs out of Purcell. It knows that it's run out of personal now, which is different to say what it was able to do five or 10 years ago. Uh, and it's able to order new batches of personal into your, you know, into your home. However, what if Samsung decided that they wanted to do a deal basically with a different detergent manufacturer or a different reseller? And rather than auto ordering personal, it was auto-ordering something else. The decision whether or not to buy Purcell in this case is now being made by the manufacturer and potentially the machine rather than the consumer. So all of a sudden your customer might change and actually probably will change because Samsung might only make 100, 200 pounds on selling the washing machine itself but as those washing machines last 10 years, they can make a substantial amount of money if they're able to take uh, a commission, a small cut, a large cut, or actually own the sales of the products that their, their products are actually using. So that's a very, very good example of disintermediation that typically, unless you actually see these things coming, could actually sideswipe you. But now that you've seen it coming, it's something you might be able to look into. Now, on the left-hand side of the triangle, we talked about exponential technologies. And today, basically, we're very familiar, basically, with a variety of futuristic technologies, technologies such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, robotics, all those kinds of things. However, you know, we're now entering an age that I call the techno-Jurassic era. And what I mean by that is, we don't just have the predisposed 10 or 20 good world-changing emerging technologies either here or on our horizon. We have over 170 of them and actually I can fit 170 basically on the starburst that you now see in front of you uh, but when you start peeling back even those layers basically there are actually about 280 emerging technologies with each emerging technology having an addressable market opportunity of anywhere between around half a trillion dollars and almost no upper end but certainly six to ten trillion dollars particularly if you look at the healthcare space for example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to walk you through a couple of those as, as an example so Today we are in the communication space, we have platforms such as 5G and we now have interplanetary platforms as well. So uh, as, uh, as Earthlings start becoming a little bit more of an interplanetary species, interplanetary internet basically plays a much bigger role. But also basically as we start looking to space to mine the seventh continent, something that we're going to be starting to do over the next se you know, several years, uh, for example, I the moon, uh, again, interplanetary internet basically is going to start playing a much more important role basically, in global communications. Similarly, when we have a look at high altitude platforms, uh, today we have about 45% of the world is actually connected. Um, so that's around 3 billion people and we have around 3.5 billion people who either have access to no internet connection or connectivity 
uh, or very poor internet connectivity. So over the next number of years, basically we have a couple of consortiums from the likes of Qualcomm, Virgin, SpaceX, who are going to be launching four and a half thousand low Earth orbit satellites into space. And what this means is that today, from an internet perspective, a digital perspective, you can target around three billion people who are connected. In the next five to ten years, you are going to be able to target everybody because everybody, provided they want to buy a smartphone or a connected device, is going to have the option to be connected to these new space internet platforms and at high speed as well. Uh, so when we have a look at, uh, for example, the, uh, the biotech space, uh, the biotech space basically is absolutely rife with innovation at the moment. So we have organisations that are creating synthetic stem cells, but similarly we all have, also have organisations basically that are uh, at the leading edge of gene editing, which is something we will talk about later. Um, we can 3D print organs, human organs. Uh, so what does that do for things like donation lists? What happens basically if you now get ill? we can now start printing parts of your body off. Everything basically from your brain to heart tissue to blood, bones, uh, cartilage, you name it. Basically you know, the list is increasing day after day. Um, similarly, when we have a look at materials, basically the, uh, the rise of nanomaterials basically over the past couple of years has been staggering. And part of the reason for that is because of the advance in new advanced manufacturing technologies and techniques. So, uh, we have a whole variety of different nanomaterials basically that are emerging. We also have biomaterials that emer are emerging as well. And again, some of those basically will actually have an impact, uh, pros and cons, on yourselves. Uh, and we'll discuss that later. Uh, in addition to that, when we have a look at, for example, the, the machine space or the computing space, uh, from a processing perspective, we have, again, a, it's a sort of another Jurassic Park of computing. So today, Moore's law is, there's no secret basically that Moore's law is slowing down. You know, we're kind of at seven and five nanometers on silicon today, uh, but we're already starting to, uh, well, arguably move to the next platforms, which are things like quantum computing, um, optical computing. We now have the architecture for DNA computers, which actually make uh, quantum computers in terms of speed uh, look like a rock. Um, we also have molecular computers, chemical computers coming down the line as well. So when we think basically that in the future we are increasingly going to be limited by the computing power that we actually have access to, uh, on the first hand we have more access to more computing power than ever before via the cloud. But that's traditional sort of x86 silicon. Uh, as we start moving and embracing these new computing platforms, we will see, for example, with quantum computing, a hundred million fold increase basically in the amount of information that you can process in any one given second. But if we move to DNA computing, then that figure actually becomes billions. And again, bearing in mind that you're sort of looking, as I sort of understand it, at a timeline of around up to 2050, these are the things basically that will be coming through by then. So again, um, as part of the planning process, this is all good. Um, Similarly, we have artificial intelligence, and with the breakthroughs that we've had in artificial intelligence over the past two years particularly, particularly when we compare the capability of artificial intelligence to humans, is just crazy. Um, so for example, we have artificial intelligence that is now better at translation than humans. Uh, we have artificial intelligence that is better at lip reading, of all things, uh, than humans. But similarly, basically, we now have artificial intelligence platforms basically, that are much better in some industries uh, than the PhDs that those industries employ. So AI is coming on at a staggering pace. Now, if we have a look, for example, at artificial general intelligence, a lot of people sort of seem to think that AGI is going to be with us in kind of 2040. Um, but frankly, when we have a look at you know, when we have a look at everything, uh, we have an architecture for AGI. And personally, I think that's now going to start emerging potentially before 2030. So, again. Technology is moving faster and faster because as you take all of these different technologies together, if you take a GPU with artificial intelligence with the cloud, you can create faster, faster AIs that learn faster. Um, we're also starting to see the first AIs that learn by themselves and to quote where some of the companies behind these AIs create knowledge for themselves. And again, we'll have a little chat about artificial intelligence in a bit. 
Um, now, other things, you know, if we have a look at things like security, uh, we have hack-proof code. Uh, if we have a look at sensors, we have graphene sensors, biosensors, biomarkers. Uh, if you want to detect the very, very early signs of cancer, uh, one to two years before you actually get cancer, biomarkers are already there. Um, similarly, basically, with a lot of these sensors, we are now able to put a lot more sensors basically into nanobots, basically, that are already going into people's bloodstreams, uh, to diagnose and assess disease. So the amount of progress when we start peeling back the layers of the onion is absolutely staggering. So with that in mind, what I want to do now is I want to walk you th through something basically that I call creative minds. Um, this is something basically that was supposed to be, according to the analysts, either coming in 2030, 2040, or according to some, shouldn't actually be possible at all. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you a short video. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's only a short one. Uh, it's a couple of minutes long. What if you could come up with thousands of options for a single design without drawing, all of which meet specific goals set by the designer? And from those options, pick the one design that delivers on the most important criteria, the design you couldn't possibly have imagined. This is generative design, a technology that harnesses massive computing power, creating forms with precise amounts of material only where needed, achieving maximum performance while wasting nothing. But generative design can be about much more than simply turning out alternatives. Prototypes can be scanned and equipped with sensors that provide real-time performance data that can be looped back into the design process so the object, in effect, co-designs itself. And depending on the material and method of manufacture chosen, the software can optimize the design for those choices. The things that have limited us in the past, software, materials, manufacturing, no longer do so. With generative design, the world can look and perform any way we want it to. This is the next stage in the evolution of design, and it's happening now. So what we just saw there was a very good example of what we call a generative adversarial network, a GAN. Uh, also known as an innovative AI, also known as a creative AI. And what that AI was doing is it was taking an instruction from a human operator, make my drone lighter and stronger. It was then drawing information in from a materials database and applying it to a digitized copy of a model. Uh, and as you can see, basically, it could generate tens of thousands of different designs basically, within seconds, uh, rapidly, you know, rapidly cutting down basically, the amount of time that you spend having to develop your next product or service. Um, however, it doesn't actually stop there. Uh, when we start getting outside into the real world, yeah, we take sensors, we put them into machines and devices and things, uh, and as those sensors pick up information about the world that that uh, the product or device basically is traveling through and interacting with, you can feed all of that back to a creative AI and that AI basically will innovate the product by itself. It doesn't need any human interaction provided it's got access to the right databases and information. So today we talk about very much basically in terms of generative design with these creative AIs. Uh, and that's simply because we've moved from passive to generative. Now, the next phase of all this is they are going to be intuitive and then they are going to become empathetic. So what I mean by that is they'll be able to, for example, go out basically to Twitter, to Facebook, to all these different, you know, these different networks, understand basically what people are complaining about, because people on Twitter might be complaining about a particular thing, identify the problem, identify the need, identify a basic product, and then iterate the product. And all of a sudden, these generative AIs are now starting to come to you saying, I listened to the internet and the internet told me that it had this problem. Um, this is the market opportunity and this is the product that I've created. And I think if you promote it this way, it will sell. We're getting to that point very, very quickly. So, however, once we're, there's, there's something even better in the box on this one. Once we get to the point where we have a generative AI, 
When we start combining it with different technologies, we can do some really, really amazing things. So generative AIs themselves are actually only made possible because of developments and advancements in artificial intelligence and computing power. However, now we start moving on to something else. As we start looking at new materials and 3D printing, we can start doing something else. And that something else is actually incredible. Uh, we saw this as a world first last year. And what I'm going to do is rather than talking about it, I'm going to show it to you on a video. So again, a small video, a couple of minutes long, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. And I will tell you basically a little bit more about it once it's played. So what we had there was an example of what we call sausage robot from Oslo University in Norway. Now, in that particular example, the researchers wanted to get that sausage robot to move from one side of the room to the other as fast as possible. Now, what they did is they, they took the robot, they put sensors into it, those sensors fed information back into a creative AI, uh, and that creative AI used all of that information about the robot's movements, the speed, etc, 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 to iterate thousands and thousands of new designs almost instantaneously. And when the AI had decided that it, it had come on something interesting, um, that it thought would move the project forward, it would send that design to a 3D printer. And at the moment, a, a human actually assembled, took all the different parts that were assembled in that 3D printer, assembled them together and got the robot to run again. Now, of course, in the future, if you swap out a 3D printer for a 4D printer, that robot that is self-evolving uh, can 3D or can 4D print itself and walk out of the printer. So what we now have is we now have a creative, innovative AI that is helping, to, helping robots self-evolve. That's a world first, and it's an example basically of where we are going in the future basically with innovation. A lot of organizations and individuals say that you can't teach AI how to innovate. But if I said to you chaps, here's a cup, cut it down by half, in terms of you know, weight, for example, you'll go through a process in your mind. You'll say, well, okay, if I'm going to make this cup half as, light, half as heavy, I could use different materials. I could cut it in half. You will go through a process in your mind. All we're doing with artificial intelligence is we are taking those individual process steps, turning them into algorithms, putting them into a process flow, et voila, you now have an innovative AI. So it doesn't necessarily need to be as creative as a human in terms of human terms. We're now starting to talk about creativity in synthetic terms. And again, when we start looking at the platforms especially that we have today, uh, what if I said to you, what if we had a way basically to speed up your rate of innovation twofold, fivefold, tenfold, 
a hundredfold, a thousandfold, ten thousandfold. That's where we go with these creative AIs. And today, they're very much basically in the hardware space. However, increasingly in 2017, we've seen some certainly interesting, uh, maybe not significant advancements uh, when it comes to things like software design. So we now have artificial intelligences from Microsoft, such as DeepCoder, that can write its own programs. We have programs from Google, such as AutoML, that now create AIs. So we have a parent AI that is now creating a child AI, and that, that child AI is better than the human experts that designed the original one uh, at the particular thing that it was tasked on doing. So this field is moving very, very fast, and it's in very, very exciting. It's very interesting, particularly from a disruption and an innovation perspective. So where some of these AIs are already being used, if you've flown in an Airbus A380, congratulations, you've been on a plane basically that was part designed by artificial intelligence. Uh, if you've been buying Architect sneakers basically from Under Armour, congratulations, they were designed by artificial intelligence. So when we now start applying some of these things basically into the FMCG space, what we have is we have creative AIs designing brand new products faster than ever before that helps manufacturers get products into market faster than ever before. Now when we start combining some of these new innovative capabilities with for example 3D printing, in Under Armour's case they've now cut the product development life cycle down for their particular train pair of trainers from 18 months down to two weeks. But similarly, because you can send that as a digital file to a shop and let someone play around in augmented reality and, and modify it and personalize them, uh, you can now use another technology, 3D printing, to 3D print them off in the back. So now we hold no inventory. Um, however, you know, being able to use an artificial intelligence to design sneakers, artificial intelligence, and then artificial intelligence and augmented reality to help people personalize these things, and then have 3D printers in the back that helps you eliminate inventory, that's fine for one sneaker. But what if we start using these technologies, not just to transform how sneakers are designed, but to transform the entire FMCG sector and the entire retail sector? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through uh, what will certainly look like, and actually I'm very tempted to say will undoubtedly become uh, an organization that will undoubtedly become uh, the world's first autonomous retailer. And I think you probably know them. Amazon. An autonomous retailer? Really? Is that what you're sort of asking me? Um, yeah? Yes. So let's walk through it. So if we have a look at Amazon, this is what Amazon are doing. This isn't what they are thinking about. This is what they are doing. These are the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle where said that they have lined up and this is where they are now headed. So Firstly, what we do, if we have a look basically at the apparel market, and we also have a look at the homeware market, so particularly fabrics, basically anything fabric based at this moment in time, what we can now do basically with Amazon basically is Amazon has created a creative AI that goes out to the internet, trolls designs, so for example, fashion designs, it will have a look on social media for popular fashions. Uh, it will then take those into its system, iterate them, and iterate new styles, new designs, and hopefully new fashion trends. Um, so, once that's done, uh, Amazon are now starting to try to think, well, okay, we have a creative AI that will help us design clothes that people hopefully like faster than ever before. Uh, they put those designs onto their website, but that's how Amazon still has a problem. You know, you go onto, you go onto web, a website, you have a look at a jacket, um, you buy a jacket, and 20% of the time those jackets, for example, go back because they just don't fit. Um, so how do we get around that problem? Right. Recently, Amazon bought a company called Body Labs. Now, when we have a look at Body Labs, Body Labs basically is simply a 3D body scanner. You can put it into a traditional camera, basically on a smartphone, or you could put it into an Echo Show. Um, now, what that device will do is it will simply scan your body measurements, take precise information and feed that back into Amazon. So Amazon now has your precise measurements on file, and that's great. Um, now, if we use something like the Echo Show, or we use something, for example, like a smart mirror in a store, we can now use augmented reality to overlay those clothes, 
precisely onto the person basically that's trying to buy them to see whether or not they like them, to see what the fit and the cut looks like, etc, etc, etc. Now, if those people like what they see in those augmented reality mirrors, they can click buy. Now, this is where we start transforming retail again. So Amazon filed a patent, it's patent number 9,782,906, uh, and it is a patent for an on-demand manufacturing system for apparel. So the order comes in from the consumer, it gets sent into this automated manufacturing system, the manufacturing system takes the, the fabrics that it needs, knits them together, sticks them together, whatever it's actually up to, uh, and produces them. So that jacket that I saw on Amazon's website now fits my precise body measurements, is now being built on demand in, as, in Amazon's own factories. And once it's, once it's built, once it's crafted, it's complete, uh, we now start sending it out to fulfillment. Now, from a fulfillment case, Amazon is already almost at the point, basically, of, fully, of being fully autonomous. Every Amazon package that you order today, basically, has, is touched by a human by 30 seconds, or for 30 seconds, sorry. Um, and that's because we have human pickers, basically, who need to pick something out of a basket or a bin and put it where, wherever it needs to go. However, using artificial intelligence, robotics, and machine vision, we now have picking robots that are faster than humans, so we can get rid of them. Um, so what we now have is we have a fully autonomous fulfillment center. However, uh, I said fully autonomous retailer, remember? So we've designed our product, Customers ordered it, we've produced it on demand, we haven't needed any human sewers or, or uh, clerks, by the way. Uh, it's now being fulfilled automatically, and we are now basically starting to ship that autonomously, so via you know, autonomous and self-driving truck, van, or drone. So, world's first fully autonomous retailer. But it doesn't just stop at clothes. Anything that's made out of fabric, for example, bed linen, curtains, cushions, you name it, they can all be created using exactly the same process. And today, this is where we start. We are starting with fabrics. But we can go so many other places, it's staggering. So this now leads us on to the possibilities for yourselves. Now, for example, I've been talking about creative AIs that are very good at iterating new hardware and that are very good at iterating new fashions and new designs. But what happens if those AIs weren't fashion designers? They were material scientists, chemists, synthetic biologists. Well, this year we have seen developments and kind of breakthroughs to a degree, again, to a degree, we're at the start, um, don't want to over-egg things. Uh, we've seen breakthroughs in all of these different areas. And so we now have artificial intelligences that can predict the outcome of organic chemical reactions. We now have artificial intelligences that can understand and diagnose the human genome. And we now have artificial intelligences that can create futuristic materials. So now let's start applying that to your business. What if you were able to use these creative AIs basically to create the first zero impact, eco-friendly protein plastics for your products? The ultimate in sustainability perhaps? No, depends on how you design them. Um, or what happens basically if we start using a synthetic biology artificial intelligence to help you create the next generation of adhesives? And talking of adhesives, are there some new markets lurking around? I think there are. Um, so this is now where we take another traditional technology, so 3D printing and bioprinting, uh, that is increasingly finding a foothold, for example, by seeing healthcare, uh, where we are now using 3D bioprinters to start 3D printing yeah, a human artificial skin, uh, human tissue, organs, and all sorts of things. Um, isn't there a need, basically, for a different type of glue, basically, in those situations? Isn't there a need for different types of materials, basically, for those particular industries, those emerging technologies, etc., etc.? 
there are. There's an opportunity. Now, similarly, again, as we start having a look at what some of these artificial intelligences could actually do and deliver, um, what about being able to create new formulations that not just reduce the toxicity or the persistence of harmful chemicals in grey water in washing machines, what happens basically if it actually helps neutralise it? So again, when we're talking about uh, laundry, home care, all those kinds of things, new formulations might be able to be found basically much, much faster than ever before. But again, you have to have that digital at the core and you have to be able to leverage, effectively leverage some of these new emerging technologies along with the ecosystems that surround them as well. But that's perfectly within your grasp. Um, similarly, you know, when we start talking about different materials, um, what if we can now start using nanomaterials and different types of nano compounds, know that we already are. Um, but again, using some of these new artificial intelligences to help you create longer lasting, better healthcare products uh, or beauty products or hair care products, all these kinds of things. Um, again, there have been so many breakthroughs in nanotechnology this year. The possibilities basically that these things afford us basically are ramping up significantly. There's a huge market there. Um, yes, it's got to be regulated. Yes, people are looking into the effects of it all. Uh, but again, those studies are now starting to come through. So what we have is we've talked through disruption. Uh, we've talked through some of the new innovative AIs uh, that are now starting to emerge into the commercial world and how they can actually help, how they are helping, not just transform how individual products are designed, but how we tear down the status quo, for example, of the retail industry, which has already been hammered time and time again, it's about to go through another hammering. You know, you start putting these technologies again into Alibaba, for example, or something like that, basically you now start setting the global steam. You know? uh, so when we have a look at uh, the future of FMCG, uh, the way that I would summarize it is, it's going to, uh, product development cycles are going to be dramatically shorter. Uh, the products and services basically that we create are going, to be, are going to be far superior to what we're seeing today. And then the way that we can deliver these basically is also going to change. Now whether it's things like smart appliances basically or just different go to markets, um, there's a whole new world of opportunity out there. So to round this off, uh, what I say to you basically is I hope this has been interesting. Uh, I hope it's been thought provoking and let the journey begin. And I wish you all the best and thank you basically for listening. Take care.